An additional thing you can do with these before you pull them into an assembly, which I like to do so that we can see the difference here, so we can change the colour. This doesn't change the material, it just changes the colour. If you want to change the material, once you're in an assembly, go to the filler materials and just do it in one hit. It's much easier. So I'll just change the colour of solid six. So I've got two individual solids here. The next step in the process after we've done whatever edits we need to do on each individual solid is turn this thing into an assembly, which we can now do quite easily using this command on the manage tab called Make Components. So what this allows you to do is select the solid or solids that you want to turn into single parts, which I've just done in the browser there. You can also select them in the graphics window if you need to. And it previews here which components it's going to make. You can change <coughs> what the assembly is going to be called, which template it's going to use, etc, etc, etc. Insert into a new assembly. Sure, let's go next. Next dialog looks very similar to your sort of duplication dialogs we see in, in the assembly mode. It gives us our parts that it's going to create. It lets us rename it if we want to. By default, it's going to take the name of whatever you call that solid. So if you haven't named any of your solids, if they're both like solid one, solid two, you can rename them at this stage and it'll call apart that instead of solid one, solid two. Change your bond structure if you need to, which template it's using, etc. And it creates, as you can see my grass has changed, my toolbars have changed. We're now in assembly mode and we've got base and solid as single parts. Now what this is doing for those of you that have been using derived components in the past, this is essentially taking each solid and deriving it and just taking that solid information. So for those of you that are familiar with that process, that's what it's doing here. So if you follow that thought pattern through to conclusion here, we are taking a, a, a single part that we can derive our entire assembly from really quickly and easily. Because if you update that original model, that original part, all of the parts that are generated from it are going to update automatically. So then now we have our assembly, our two components. You can continue constraining it if you want, but just bear in mind that it's going to ground each part as it brings it in. So if you need to constrain it and have a relationship between the parts, unground it and constrain it as you require. Next thing I want to go over with these multi-body uh, parts as well is the, uh, the little ability here to move bodies. It's only a small thing. What it enables you to do is take any solid and just shift it doesn't affect the original part. So I might want to shift this one out just to get a good look at it. All right, it gives you feedback straight away as to where it's going to move it to. So I'm moving it in accordance to the XYZ. And I can move it out. Okay, no effect on the original part. So that these solid parts, these solid bodies as they're called, they're really individual components. Try to think of them like that if you're going to use them. Okay, next concept, sketch blocks, which is pretty cool, alright, so we've got a sketch and we've, we want to um, analyse here the movement of the assembly, we don't want to go to the trouble of creating the entire damn assembly and then see that something doesn't match or something doesn't meet, we have to go and re rebuild some of the parts, what sketch blocks are designed to do is help you uh, fast track your sort of concept stage in a way. So they're stored in a folder here under your part file called blocks. Again, sorry. They're stored in a folder under your part called blocks. And they're also stored under any sketch that you insert them into. If I activate the sketch, we now can insert or place any block that we wish. Onto any point that we wish. The constraints it uses are the sketch constraints, but think of them as assembly constraints in this context. So we might want to, let's have a look at this on the front view. So we might want this thing to extend and meet in the middle and be uh, 90 degrees, so that we can test how long, um, it, how long the rods have to be. So what we can do within these blocks, whether they be assembly or part blocks, here is that we can use our assembly sort of conditions on these. We can turn them flexible, we can make them adaptive. And then they'll respond based on which constraints you put on these blocks. So for instance, in a cylinder assembly, if I make this flexible, 
And flexible, as you know, enables you to use the constraints of the sublevel components in an assembly. It's the same concept carried down. We'll make the lower level component flexible as well. That means that I can now drag the rod back and forth. These are just sketch constraints. They're really simple. Coincident, collinear, parallel, etc. These aren't your complicated assembly constraints that can get really overwhelming at times. So from this point, we can go to our nicely expanded sketch constraints, thank you, Ribbon, and make them coincident. And then it's just a simple matter of saying be vertical. Okay, and we can preempt how long the rod needs to be for the meat at 90 degrees. Okay? And it's just using simple sketches rather than complicated parts <coughs> that you've already built. Alright? Is that a thing you guys are likely to use? Is that important? Yeah? I hope so. Okay. Now I'll show you how to create these blocks. Alright, so this is one that already existed. I'll just create a new part. And we'll create a couple of new blocks. And a block can, honestly, it can be anything. Any shape that you draw again and again. Um, let's do an offset. Apply any dimensions that you need to. Any sort of common shapes, I suppose. And then we've got a command here on the layout um, panel called Create Block. Now you can either select all your sketch geometry, then hit Create Block, or hit Create Block and select all your geometry. So where you can work. Insert point is going to be where your mouse hovers around when you insert it. So just pick wherever you want that to be. Name it. It stays in our sketch, because that's where we created it, but it also is added to a folder called Box in the browser that we can read. It's on it again! <laughs> Blocks in the browser that we can then either place again or save to a template or copy and paste between documents. So I can go to, let's see, my sketch blocks. And there's my rectangle block now in my new document. I'm on my sketch and I can place it. It's really easy to copy and paste these things around. You can create as many blocks as you need to um, <coughs> using whatever sketch geometry that you want to use um, or whatever you need really. And as I said at the beginning, you can save it to a template. So if I open this template, I've got blocks that I created previously. It just makes it really easy to create your sketches, particularly if you're creating common shapes all the time. I really highly recommend this. Okay? Good stuff. <coughs>